have a prison condition exclusion in your plan, however, it must be removed for kids under age 19 before the next plan year. And note that this prohibition only applies to health plans. It is still permissible to have a pre-existing condition exclusion in other types of plans, including disability plans. The next immediate reform that is for all plans uh, is the reform that uh, it applies to all plans that offer dependent coverage. Those plans must make coverage available to children up to their 26th birthday. The only criteria for covering children are age up to age 26 and relationship, the child of the employee. You can no longer condition coverage on the child's student status, whether the child is as a dependent of the employee, where the child lives, or how the child is supported, and still no requirement to cover grandchildren or the spouse of a child. Cover the child must be identical to coverage for other dependents, and it must be offered at identical cost. So, for example, if you offer two tiers of coverage, single and family coverage, and an employee with family coverage adds an adult child, you can't charge that employee any additional premium adult child. You could restructure your tiers of coverage as single, single plus one, single plus two, etc. The only requirement is that adult children cannot be treated any differently from other dependents. One thing change for employers in the immediate future is that you have to have a 30-day enrollment period for employees to enroll their adult children. And tell you, you could run your regular two or three week open enrollment period for employees and then extend it to 30 days solely to add adult children, but most employers are just using a 30-day open enrollment period for this year. It is currently on, on COBRA coverage and is added back into the plan as an adult dependent, the adult will have a full new set of COBRA rights when he or she ages out of the plan again at age 26. Also, care reform amended the Internal Revenue Code to confirm that the cost of providing coverage to adult children is excludable from federal income tax, and that federal tax treatment extends, the, the favorable federal tax treatment extends until the end of the calendar year in which the child attains age 26. Um, therefore, the, the substantive requirement is that you provide coverage to children up to their 26th birthday, but if you want to do more than that and offer them coverage through the end of the year in which they attain age 26, you can add and the cost of that coverage will still be excluded from aim for federal income tax purposes. Now, the age 26 coverage must be offered by all plans that otherwise offer dependent coverage, including grandfather plans. However, there's one caveat for grandfather plans. If a plan is grandfathered, it may exclude adult children who are eligible for coverage through another employer's plan. Thus, for example, if your child is working and has access to his or her own health coverage, it can be excluded from the parent's grandfather plan, but the exclusion will only last until 2014. The immediate reform is prohibition on lifetime and annual limits. This applies to all plans, including grandfather plans. The problem on annual limits is actually phased in over time, but as you can see, the phase in for annual limits is quite high. Now, the lifetime and annual limits apply, or the prohibition on lifetime and annual limits apply to minimum essential benefits, which is loosely defined right now uh, as sort of high level uh, elements of coverage like medical care and prescription drug care and hospitalization, those sorts of things. The items that would not be covered, we think, are uh, certainly accepted benefits, things like standalone dental plans, standalone vision plans, um, retired only plans would also be exempt from the lifetime and annual limits. If someone has been limited, by, if someone has been excluded by a lifetime limit in the past, you now must give that person an enrollment opportunity of at least 30 days, and there must be notice provided by the first day of the next plan year, or January 1 for calendar year plans. Uh, allow the person to re-enroll in your plan now that the lifetime limit no, no longer applies. Also an opportunity, if you have uh, a, a program that imposes an annual limit, you could apply to HHS to seek a waiver of the annual limit prohibition 
um, for your plan. And this is uh, this addresses circumstances where it might be available to a certain segment of your employee population, and, and maybe the standard in the industry is not to allow any coverage. Uh, NHS could therefore waive any annual limit that would apply to that coverage if the alternative is to provide no coverage at all. The immediate reform is that there can no longer be a rescission of coverage except for situations of fraud or intentional misrepresentation of material fact. Now, a rescission of coverage means a retroactive termination of coverage. So you, if you decide today to elect to terminate coverage as of July 1st, 2010, that would be a rescission, and you only do that for fraud or intentional misrepresentation of a material fact. You could also do it for failure to pay premiums. In order to do a retroactive rescission of coverage, however, you must provide at least 30 days advance written notice, even though the rescission will be retroactive. An immediate reform. If your plan requires a participant to pick a primary care provider, no must be provided to each participant about the uh, system by which he chooses a, a participating care provider, the terms and conditions under which the participating care provider must be chosen. Can be included in an SPD or communication with SPD like language. Uh, another element. This is that emergency and OBGYN services have to be covered without preauthorization and without regard to network provider status. Prevent health care benefits. This is another immediate reform. And importantly, this one does not apply to grandfather plans. As I mentioned before, Renee is going to talk about what a grandfather plan is. But decide to have a grandfather plan, you don't have to cover preventive health services without cost sharing. The requirement in health care reform is for non-grandfather plans, health care services must be covered without employee cost sharing, things like immunizations and maternity care and pediatric, a lot of pediatric preventive care screenings and that sort of thing. All of these things must be covered without cost sharing requirements. Now, for you who are deciding between grandfather and non-grandfather plans, this may be a cost, a significant cost, uh, to amend your plan to comply with this requirement because you're taking away the cost sharing requirements. When you decide whether you're going to have a grandfather plan or not, you're going to have to take into account the cost of adding this provision. One area that is the subject of very recent regulations uh, but hasn't really received a lot of press is that there is a new appeals process in healthcare reform. And this is not applicable applicable to grandfathered plans. So again, if you want to avoid this requirement, you might consider trying to grandfather your plan. But under this new appeals process for health care reform, which is effective as of the first day of the next plan year, um, there is revised internal claims procedure process. There's revised requirements for the notices that have to be sent out. The, the OLEs or the claimants will have some additional rights. And most importantly, there will be a binding external review process, which is really new, especially in the context of self-funded plans. So these are some of the changes that apply to the internal appeals process. Um, plans uh, that are subject to ERISA may certainly continue to use the Department of Labor Safe Harbor procedures that are like currently in effect, but there are some modifications. And maybe the most significant modification is that, that Urgent care determinations, which used to be made in a 72-hour time frame, now must be made in 24 hours. Um, so you're accelerating the time frame for deciding urgent care claims. When you uh, have an adverse benefit determination, you decide that a claim should not be covered under the plan, there are new requirements about the level of detail that you have to include in the denial letter. Um, things like including diagnosis codes and denial codes and treatment codes and explaining what all of those things mean. You have to explain the entire appeals process and you have to disclose contact information for the Health Insurance Consumer Assistance Office or the Health Insurance Ombudsman in your state. There's also a requirement to have continued coverage pending the outcome of, a, of an appeal. Now, there are regulations. There isn't a lot of guidance as to what exactly this means. 
certainly in the context of a continuing care situation where uh, the, the, um, the, the, the question of the person should stay in a hospital, for example, or be moved to a rehab facility, um, it would that while that appeal of that claim is pending, then they would have to stay in the hospital to keep, continue to receive the hospital care. It's a little less clear when the situation is whether or not a patient wants to have some sort of experimental treatment covered. Presumably, the plan would not, the, the patient wouldn't be permitted to go get the experimental treatment and have the plan pay for it uh, while the appeal is being decided. But uh, hopefully, there will be more guidance on exactly what the continuing coverage requirement means. External appeals. Um, for self-funded plans, this is really brand new. Uh, for insured plans, in states, uh, they will have an existing state external appeal process, meaning you go through the internal appeals uh, at the plan and at the insurance company, and before you go to court, there's an external reviewer that's appointed by the state that will decide the claim. For This external review process is actually extended to all plans now, uh, except grandfather plans. Plans can use one of two things. If they are subject to the state laws, they can use, they have to use the state insurance process. If they're self-funded, you can either use the state process if it's extended to self-funded plans, or you can use the federal stand for external appeals. And the Department of Labor has issued an interim safe harbor, and it includes things like the claimant has four months to uh, to request the external external review. There are some time frames as to how the external review has to take place. But the significant one is that the plan has to retain at least three independent review organizations. Um, and the idea is that you you, you uh, enhance independence by rotating the independent review organization that's going to review each appeal. But the is that if you have to do that by the first day of the next plan year, which might be January 1, 2011, you have to contract with the three IROs before that date in order to be in full compliance with the Department of Labor's harbor. It's a lot to do between now and December 31st. Some other health care reform uh, developments, which I will just briefly touch on a few of them. Um, the Early Retiree Reinsurance Program. Uh, you have not already applied, it may be too late to apply as a practical matter, uh, but this basically provides employers that have retiree health coverage with a subsidy, a fairly significant subsidy from the federal government. The trick is that there's only $5 billion allocated to this uh, program, and at last count there were 2,000 employers that had already been approved for reimbursement, including such large employers as state governments and General Motors and, you know, the, the, the UW and some very large unions. So there might not be enough money left if you haven't applied at this point. There is a small employer tax credit. If you're, a, if you're an employer with 25 full-time employees or under, or full-time equivalent employees or under, then you can get a tax credit of up to 35% of, of the cost of providing coverage to your employees. If you are a nonprofit, that tax credit is 25%. Um, and it's applied in the nonprofit context, it's applied against your FICA liability. That it is available this year. So if you're a small employer and you're providing your health care coverage, you should make sure you determine whether you're eligible for this tax credit. Also, some Medicare Part D changes, uh, uh, some FSA changes, which, which I'll talk about in a second, and some W-2 reporting and auto-enrollment changes, which we'll also get into. Health days. Uh, maybe the, the thing that's received the most headlines recently is over-the-counter drug costs are no longer eligible for reimbursement from health FSAs and HSAs beginning January 1, 2011. It doesn't matter what your plan year is. This applies as of January 1, 2011, and you cannot take advantage of the 2010 grace period either. Once you hit January 1, 2011, you cannot be reimbursed for over-the-counter drugs. Uh, there are some other changes to HSAs, and, and the FSA limit, the $2,500 limit, doesn't come into effect until 2013. Auto enrollment. If you're an employer with 200 or more, or sorry, more than 200 full-time employees, you must automatically enroll those employees in health 
coverage. This is like what you do with 401k and 403b plans, or what a lot of employers do with 401k and 403b plans. Hire a new employee, the default is that they are covered by one of your health care options unless they elect otherwise. You have to provide some advance notice on this. The question here is what's the effective date? There is no effective date in the statute, which suggests that the effective date is the date of enactment, which is March 23, 2010. Most employers seem to be waiting either for January 1, 2011, the first day of the, of the next plan year, or in regulations are issued by the Department of Labor, and we think either of those approaches are, is probably a reasonable way to go. Last note, there is some W-2 reporting. For 2011, you're going to have to report the value of employer-provided coverage. So in January 2012, you're going to have to report for 2011. Most employers are going to use the COBRA rules to determine this amount. Let's back to the question of grandfathering. Do you want to be a grandfather plan, or do you not want to be a grandfather plan? As we'll see, being a grandfather plan to out of a few of the immediate reforms and a few of the longer-term reforms, the downside is it limits your flexibility as to what you can do with plan design. And with that, I'll turn the microphone over to Renee Applegate. As Brian noted, there are a number of requirements applicable beginning for plan years um, on, or on or after September 23, 2010, um, including grandfathered plans. Um, but it's also in determining whether or not you would like to maintain grandfathering for your plans, it's also important to be aware of, of changes that are not applicable to grandfather plans. Um, some of these requirements are costly and burdensome to administer. Um, and you will want to take this into account in making your decision. Um, among them are, as Brian mentioned, the prohibition on cost sharing for preventive care, the application of the non-discrimination rules to insured plans, currently they apply only to self-funded plans, um, the new internal and external review procedures that Brian described, uh, various reporting requirements, with minimum coverage requirements and limits on cost sharing. So what is a grandfathered plan? Uh, not all plans are eligible for grandfathering. In order to be grandfathered, a plan must have been in existence on March 23, 2010 and provide continuous coverage to at least one individual. It does not mean that, that the same individual must be covered March um, 23, 2010 onward, but the plan must be covering someone uh, from March 23, 2010 onward. New fees are permitted in the plan as long as they are uh, family members of existing enrollees, as long as those family members would have been permitted to enroll under the terms of the plan in effect on March 23rd. Also permitted are new employees and their families and current employees and their families who aren't currently enrolled in the plan or who weren't enrolled in the plan on March 23rd. There are anti-abuse provisions to prevent employers from circumventing the rules by basically moving employees from another plan into a grandfathered plan where there's no legitimate employment purpose. Note that grandfathering applies separately to each benefit package. So if an employer offers both an HMO and PPO option, there, you know, it may preserve grandfathering for one but not for the other, and that may, may make sense depending on your circumstances. Um, grandfathered plans are required to satisfy certain record keeping and disclosure requirements uh, to document the status as a grandfathered plan and to communicate that to plan participants. Uh, but perhaps most importantly, there are changes changes that grandfathered plans aren't permitted to make. And if those changes are made, that will terminate the plan's grandfathered status, and it will be required to satisfy all of the health care reform requirements. And that is what we're going to turn to um, right now. First of all, a grandfathered plan is not permitted to change insurers or enter into a new insurance contract with its current insurer. It's permitted to renew insurance contracts that were in place on March 23, 2010. And this limitation doesn't apply to third-party administrators, only to insurers. Also, a grandfather plan may not eliminate all or substantially all benefits to diagnose or treat a particular condition. Under the regulations, this, the elimination of benefits for any necessary element to diagnose or treat a particular condition is, is viewed as the elimination of all or substantially all benefits. For example, um, if a plan before 
before March 23, 2010, provided, that benefits, provided benefits for a particular mental health condition, which was did through a combination of counseling and prescription medication, if it eliminated the coverage for counseling, the plan would cease to be grandfathered. Additionally, additionally, there are a number of restrictions on the ability to change the cost structure of grandfathered plans. For any increase in an individual's coinsurance percentage is prohibited. For example, in March 23rd, a plan required a participant to pay 20% of the cost of inpatient surgery. Then, going forward, that percentage not be increased above 20%. Employers will have some ability to make changes to fixed dollar cost sharing, but that will be subject to the following parameters. For fixed cost sharing other than copayments, such as deductibles, employers may increase those amounts, but not by more than the rate of medical inflation since March, 20, March 2010, plus 15%. For fixed dollar copayments, the increase may not increase the greater not exceed the greater of either the rate of medical inflation plus 15% or $5 increased by the rate of medical inflation since March 2010. The, the grandfathering regulations describe how medical inflation is determined. Generally, it's a component of the consumer price index for all urban consumers published by the Department of Labor. The next citation is likely a significant one for or maybe a significant one for many employers. If an employer decreases its contribution toward the cost of any tier of coverage by more than 5% of its contribution rate in effect on March 23, 2010, the plan will lose its grandfathered status. As all of you are probably painfully aware, the cost of coverage has increased substantially in the last few years, and those increases, coupled with the economic downturn, have forced a lot of employers to raise the participant contribution rates. But going forward, grandfather plans, if they want to remain grandfathered, will have of the lion's share of rate increases. Finally, grandfathered plans are prohibited from making certain changes to lifetime and annual limits that would be adverse to plan participants. Well, all changes made to a plan since March 23, 2010 are relevant to determine whether a plan qualifies as a grandfathered plan. There are some exceptions. Changes that became effective after March 23rd, but were made pursuant to a contract or a plan amendment that was entered into or adopted prior to March 23rd, will not affect the plan's grandfathering status. And because regulations relating to grandfathering were not issued until June 14th, there's a grace period to correct any changes made between March 23rd and June 14th. If those changes are revoked or modified, effective, as of the day of the first plan year beginning on or after September 23rd, then they will not affect grandfathering and the plan can remain grandfathered. Um, the, in addition to the changes that I've already described, there may be additional limitations placed on grandfathered plans. Um, it's a bit trying to read the future, but the agencies who issued the grandfathering regulations, the IRS, the Department of Labor, and the Department of Health and Human Services, are seeking comment on the extent to which other changes should be limited for grandfathered plans. And they have specifically identified change in plan structure, such as switching from an insured to self-funded plan, changes in provider networks, and changes in prescription drug formularies. So we will just have to stay tuned and find out um, if additional guidance is issued on those points. The bargain plans are subject to somewhat relaxed grandfathering rules for a brief period, but they don't enjoy the broad exemption that the legislation suggested. Generally, grandfathered collectively bargained plans are subject to the same requirements as other grandfathered plans, with the following exception. Um, for insured plans that are maintained pursuant to one or more collective bargaining, bargaining agreements, um, the grandfathered status of those plans will be maintained until the termination of the last collective bargaining agreement that was in effect on March 23rd. At that point, the plan's grandfathered status is determined by comparing the terms of the plan time to the terms of the plan that were in effect on March 23rd. If the commission shows any prohibited changes other than a change in insurer, the plan will cease to be grandfathered at that point. Um, change in insurer alone during that period will not cause a loss in grandfathered status, but any change in insurers thereafter will affect grandfathering. The requirements applicable to grandfathered plans relate to disclosure and record keeping. 
for all materials that are provided to a participant or beneficiary that describe the benefits provided under the plan must include a specific notice to the effect that the plan is intended to be a grandfather health plan, um, the types of applications that are affected by this rule are summary plan descriptions and any enrollment materials that describe benefits. The notice also must include contact information for questions and complaints regarding the plan's grandfathered status. And there is a model notice that's been issued by the agencies um, that, is, that satisfies the requirements. In addition, the employer is required to keep records documenting the terms of the plan in effect on March 23, 2010, in order to prove that the plan is, in fact, a grandfathered plan. And these records must be made available for review by plan participants and government agencies. Um, and with that, I'm going to, we're going to shift gears and Jonathan is going to address mental health parity. Thank you, Renee. Um, as Renee suggested, we're going to be switching gears here and talking about mental health parity. And um, <clears throat> I'm going to be talking specifically about the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act of 2008, uh, which I'll be referring to as the 2008 Act throughout the presentation. Group health plans were amended last year to broadly comply with these new rules. Interim final regulations that provide much needed clarity on the 2008 Act were issued in February 2010. The regulations being overshadowed by the media frenzy surrounding national health care reform this past winter, they should not be overlooked when making year amendments and plan design changes. Before we delve into the specifics of the 2008 Act, I'd like to provide a cursory overview of the Mental Health Parity Act of 1996, which I'll refer to throughout the presentation as the 1996 Act. The 1996 Act requires that annual or lifetime dollar limits on mental health benefits be no lower than any such dollar limits for medical and surgical benefits offered by a group health plan or health insurance issuer offering coverage in connection with a group health plan. The 1996 Act does not apply to substance abuse, chemical dependency, or other types of design provisions other than annual or lifetime limits. The 2000 Act attempts to backfill these gaps in the 1996 Act. The Act preserves the protections set forth in the 1996 Act, and it adds significant new protections by requiring parity with regard to annual and lifetime dollar limits requirements and treatment limitations. Treatment limitations come in two varieties, quantitative and non-quantitative. I will discuss these requirements, particularly the financial requirements and the treatment limitations, in great detail in a few minutes. With the effective dates, the interim regulations that were issued in February 2010 become effective for calendar year plans on January 1, 2011 and non-calendar year plans on or after July 1, 2010 which means they may be effective already for some plans. What the 2008 Act does not do. While the 2008 Act adds significant new protections, it does not require large group health plans and health insurance issuers to include mental health substance abuse benefits in their benefit pa packages. The law's requirements apply only to large group health plans and health insurance issuers that already include mental health and substance abuse benefits in their benefit packages. The law also does not require plans to cover specific mental health and substance abuse conditions, specify what is considered a mental health or substance abuse service. These services are determined by using a standard that is generally accepted in the relevant medical community. It does not apply to small employers with employers with between two and 50 employees. It does a self-funded government plans that make an election to opt out. And plans that take advantage of the increased cost exemption can also get out of the requirements of the 2008 Act. Final point in this slide, the 2008 Act does not preempt state insurance law. The first pair requirement deals with lifetime and annual dollar limits. The mechanics of these requirements generally remain the same under the 2008 Act as under the 1996 Act, but are expanded to apply to substance abuse. The 
for these limits is broken down into three categories. See them on the slide. First, if a health plan does not impose or imposes a lifetime or annual dollar limit on less than one third of all medical surgical benefits, then does not impose a limit on mental health substance abuse benefits. Number two, if a health plan imposes a lifetime or annual dollar limit on at least two thirds of all medical surgical benefits, then it may impose the same or a lesser limit on, on mental health substance abuse benefits. If a plan imposes a lifetime or annual dollar limit on more than one third, but less than two thirds, so effectively you're falling in between the first two uh, categories on the slide, then it may not impose a limit on mental health substance abuse benefits, or it may impose a limit that is equal to the weight average of the limits imposed. The determination of whether the portion of medical surgical benefits subject to a lifetime or annual dollar limit represents less than one third or more than two thirds of all medical surgical benefits is based on the dollar amount of all planned payments for medical surgical benefits expected to be paid by the health plan for the plan year. This breakdown can be performed using any reasonable method. Secondary requirement deals with the financial requirements and quantitative treatment limitations. A health plan may not apply any financial requirement or quantitative treatment limitation to mental health or substance abuse benefits any classification that is more restrictive than the requirement or limitation of that type applied to substantially all medical surgical benefits in the same classification. The 2008 Act's requirements apply separately to each combination of available coverage. For example, a plan that offers three medical benefit options with the mental health substance abuse benefits would have to be evaluated with respect to each benefit option to ensure compliance. And as you'll note in the last point of the slide, uh, the regulations specifically address sponsors of group health plans who previously took creative positions with respect to plan design. Group health plans are not able to evade the parity rules by carving out mental health substance abuse benefits. If planned cited, the applicable benefit package options will be looked at as one for parity purposes. To properly apply this second parity requirement, we first need to look at how certain terms are defined. Financial requirements include deductibles, copayments, insurance, and pocket maximums. Quantity treatment limitations include the number of office visits, days of coverage, and waiting periods. Plans often vary the financial requirements and treatment limitations imposed on benefits based on whether a treatment is provided on an inpatient, outpatient, or emergency basis. The regulations do not define these classifications because their meaning may differ from plan to plan or based on state insurance law. However, if a plan provides any benefits for mental health or substance abuse conditions, benefits must be provided for that condition or disorder in each classification for which medical or surgical benefits are provided. This is not designed to expand the range of mental health or substance abuse disorders covered under the plan, but rather ensure parity with medical and surgical benefits. When change plan to design, special attention must be paid to the six categories of classifications to avoid having a plan that complies with respect to one classification, but not the other. A two test is available to determine whether a group health plan complies with the 2008 Act. First, you must determine whether the financial requirement or quantitative treatment limitation applies to substantially all of the medical benefits in a classification. In the key doing this two-step test, you have to focus on what substantially all and predominant level mean. The term substantially all means at least two-thirds. Therefore, for example, if you're looking um, at your package option and you're taking a look at COPAs or office visit limitations, you'd have to look to see if they apply to at least two-thirds of one of the classifications. For instance, inpatient and network uh, would be one. And if the answer in step one is yes, 
then you need to determine the predominant level of the financial requirement and or quantitative treatment limitation that applies to medical surgical benefits in that classification. The term predominant level means at least 50%. If no single level applies to at least 50% of the medical surgical benefits, you combine levels until the threshold is met. However, once you start combining levels, you have to apply the least restrictive level in the combination. For instance, if you combined uh, med surgical co-pays for, let's say, there it was 10, 20, and 30 dollars to meet your 50% requirement, the 10 copay would be the maximum amount you could charge for mental health substance abuse benefits. You have to choose the least costly copay. That example between the 10, 20, and 30 dollar copays. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, the determination of whether the portion of medical surgical benefits in a classification subject to a financial requirement or quantitative treatment limitation represents two-thirds or more than one-half of all medical surgical benefits is based on the dollar amount of all payments for medical surgical benefits expected to be by the health plan using any reasonable method for the plan year. Related issues that I'd like to touch on before we move on to the third parity requirement. A health plan must provide out-of-network mental health substance abuse benefits when provides out-of-network medical surgical benefits. Those benefits have to be provided uh, with parity. They, they cannot be, you cannot uh, disadvantage the mental health or substance abuse benefits uh, with respect to the medical surgical benefits. Another related issue uh, occurs with separate deductibles and out-of-pocket maximums. They may not be imposed on um, <clears throat> a, a different basis for mental health substance abuse, substance abuse benefits as they are for medical surgical benefits, if they're equal. So that means if you have a $200 deductible on medical surgical and a $200 deductible on mental health, that, that doesn't pass the test just as a $400 deductible on medical surgical and a $200 deductible on mental health substance abuse would not pass the test. And the last point I'd like to make is that psychologists and other mental health providers cannot be classified as specialists for the purpose of imposing higher co-payments or other cost sharing. The third requirement deals with non-quantitative treatment limitations. Plans impose a variety of limits affecting the scope or duration of benefits under the plan that are not expressed numerically. Nevertheless, such non-quantitative provisions are also treatment limitations affecting the scope or duration of benefits under the plan. Any processes, strategies, evidentiary standards, or other factors used by a group health plan in applying non-quantitative treatment limitation to mental health substance abuse benefits in a classification must be comparable to and applied no more stringently than those used in applying the limitation with respect to medical surgical benefits in the classification. Now, there's an exception to this to the extent recognized clinically appropriate standards of care permit a difference. Limitations provide an illustrative list of non quantitative treatment limitations. These include medical management standards, prescription drug formulary design standards for provider admission to participate in the network, determination of usual, customary, and reasonable amounts, require using lower cost therapies before the plan will cover more expensive therapies. Sometimes these are known as fail first policies or step therapy protocols. And finally, conditioning benefits on completion of a course of treatment. Remember, this list is illustrative. It is not exhaustive. There are a few new disclosure requirements with respect to the 2008 Act. Criteria for medical necessity determinations made under a plan with respect to mental health or substance abuse benefits be made available by the plan administrator to any current or potential participant, beneficiary, or contracting provider upon request. Second, any denial under a group health plan of reimbursement or payment for services with respect to mental health or substance abuse must be available in the case of any participant or beneficiary upon request or is otherwise required. For a RAND, disclosure must be made in a form 
and manner consistent with the ERISA claims procedures regulations. And for plans, compliance with the form and manner of ERISA claims procedures regulations will all satisfy this disclosure requirement. I'm now going to turn the program over to Gene Hemphill, who will be discussing HIPAA and high tech developments. Jonathan, um, as if we didn't have enough to worry about, uh, we also have some HIPAA changes uh, to address. The uh, amendments to the uh, HIPAA statute came in February of 2009 as part of the stimulus bill, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. And part of that law was called the Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act, or it's referred to as high tech. So these are high tech amendments to HIPAA. And the reason for most of these amendments is because the stimulus bill included uh, substantial funding to uh, accelerate the development of electronic health records, uh, both at the provider side and also, uh, as you will see, with some of the electronic transactions. So they wanted to uh, clarify and strengthen some of the individual privacy and security protections that currently exist in HIPAA uh, as part of that initiative. The uh, law, uh, most of the uh, requirements of the law became effective February 18, 2010, although there are different effective dates for different provisions. And um, for example, the breach notification rules, which we're going to spend some time reviewing, became effective uh, as of September 23, 2009. The uh, HHS recently acknowledged that because final rules will not take effect on most of these subjects until after the actual effective dates, that it may be difficult for covered entities and business associates to apply to comply with, with these requirements. And therefore, they have made it clear that they intend to provide at least 180 days beyond the effective date of the final regulations for plans to come into the compliance. Uh, so stating, they also stated that there will be no additional one-year period for small plans, as there has been uh, on many of the HIPAA uh, effective dates for regulations. Um, they also stated that with respect to business associate agreement changes, which we will review, there will be at least a one-year transition period. Um, finally, uh, the patient protection and affordable the health care reform that Brian and Renee reviewed, also includes new HIPAA transaction standards. We're not going to cover those in any depth today because the first one really becomes effective in January uh, of 2013. But they do provide for the development of operating rules for electronic exchange of information and several new uh, electronic transaction standards that your uh, HIPAA security uh, and uh, privacy officers should be aware of. Uh, let's go to a quick a list of some of the amendments that HITECH enacted. First, as many of you are aware, business associates were only subject to some provisions of HIPAA and only through um, contract agreements with covered entities. And covered entities are only providers, health plans, and health care clearinghouses. HITECH now makes business associates subject directly to the regulations. However, it continued the contractual arrangements between business associates and covered entities. Business associates are now subject to many of the privacy and security rule requirements and the contractual agreements that they have with covered entities. The HITECH amendments also enhanced various individual rights to disclosures and access your protected information. There are increased restrictions on covered entities and business associates for the use of protected information, the sale of PHI, marketing and fundraising exceptions that exist in the current privacy rules, there is uh, some de-identification guidance. We made a few changes to the authorization requirements uh, for use of PHI for reasons other than healthcare uh, operations treatment and payment transactions. 
Uh, they relate to primarily to uh, research authorizations. Also, uh, since we are in the beginning of the school year, I might add one uh, change that's been made relating to disclosure of student immunization records to schools. Uh, this will greatly facilitate all those pediatricians' offices that are trying to answer all these forms. Um, but the information and authorization of the individual is no longer required if you meet the requirements of the rule, which is that the only PHI that's being released is limited to proof of immunization, and the school is required by state or other law to have that proof. And uh, the covered has permission, even if it's oral, from the parent or guardian. Uh, it's not very, uh, it's not really relevant to this group unless you're a parent scurrying around trying to fulfill this requirement. Uh, the new uh, brief notification requirements are a very big significance. They're already in effect, and this is the first time that HIPAA requires individuals to get notice from health plans. There has been a, a breach of their uh, privacy, uh, the privacy rule. Also, uh, increased penalties. Uh, for enforcement and for audits. Uh, we have a lot of regulations on these at this point, and on July 14th, there were proposed uh, regulations issues which we will review. Uh, first, going to business associates, as I said, they are now subject directly to the privacy rule regulation requirements, most of them. Uh, and very importantly, business associates must now have, have written business associate-like agreements with their subcontractors. So we're now putting it down yet again. Uh, these became effective. Uh, the statute was effective February 18, 2010, but as I said, the regulations are just coming out now. They came out July 14th as proposed rulemaking. Um, and uh, uh, there is transitional compliance uh, provision in the proposed rule. If you currently have a business associate agreement with your your various vendors, you will be deemed in compliance if uh, prior to the publication of the final rule, um, you are operating under an agreement that complied with the rule that was in effect before these regulations came out. So now, if you have a situation where you are renewing or modifying a current uh, business associate agreement or a contract that includes business associate provisions, uh, it, uh, it will also be deemed compliant unless it is done 60 days after the final rule. Uh, and you still have 240 days after the date of the publication of the final rule to uh, update your agreement. Uh, your prior contract meets uh, the requirements that were in effect for a business associate agreement. You essentially have uh, one year and 240 days after the final rule is published to amend your business associate agreement to comply with regulations. Uh, and the requirements really that you'll have to add to your business associate agreement relate to some of these individual rights uh, that we're about to cover and also um, the, 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 the breach notification rules. Uh, look at some of these individual rights. Again, uh, these were discussed in the July 14th uh, post rules. The comment period for that, by the way, closed yesterday. So uh, then we will see when we get the final regs. Uh, first is uh, the privacy rule currently uh, allows an individual to request a restriction on disclosures of their PHI, and typically a plan does not have to comply with that. Neither are two instances where uh, they, a plan will have to honor that request. First, uh, if the disclosure is to a health plan, uh, is, 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 it, is it to health plan, healthcare operation uh, activity, and the will ask for uh, a restriction, the health plan will have to comply with it. If it's a prover, uh, they and it's a treatment activity, they don't have to comply with it unless the PHI relates to healthcare item or service that has been paid for out of pocket in full from the body individual. In other words, if uh, an individual wants to have a procedure and wants to maintain complete privacy of it and restrict uh, any disclosure of that information, if they just pay for it in full in cash, 
the provider can't release that information. The important thing for health plans on this one is that your privacy notices have to be amended to include a specific statement about these rights. The other additional change, uh, strengthening of individual rights, is that covered entity or now a business associate must produce an electric copy of PHI if it's requested and available uh, from the plan. Uh, the individual can also request that that electronic record be sent to a designated individual. Uh, the plan may not charge more than a reasonable cost basis fee. Now, the good news is that the addition in the proposed regs is they are specifically stating that you can include in your calculation of the cost based fee for copying and supplies, and that's new. Uh, Further on individual rights, there is an expansion of the accounting for disclosures requirement that relates to electronic health records, and many health plans are now offering uh, health uh, electronic health records. And uh, you must have account you must account for those for a three-year period. The current account for other records is six years. Uh, with respect to marketing. Marketing requirements uh, have been amended. With respect to a plan, uh, you will not have a use of that marketing exception if you are getting really any compensation or remuneration uh, from the vendor uh, for making that communication. And um, there are requirements there. Uh, fundraising, uh, there are also new requirements for uh, communications having an opt out right for future fundraising appeals if you uh, are using PHI for fundraising. Uh, now let's turn to the uh, breach notification rules. Uh, these became effective September 23rd, and I just want to uh, give an interesting note. Uh, final rules were actually filed with MO, uh, the Office of Management and Budget in May, and on July 28th, uh, HHS withdrew those rules from OMB, I guess uh, they're going to do a, a rewrite of them. Uh, the, the HHS statement said this is a very complex subject and they want to uh, uh, review it further and they intend to publish a final rule within the coming months. And they said in the meantime, this interim final rule still remains effective. So I'm not sure what uh, all that's about, but we will see. Uh, what breach, first of all, a breach uh, that you have to give notice for only relates to unsecured PHI. Uh, the, the regulations and guidance on unsecured PHI is really, there's only two types of secured PHI. That's PHI that's either encrypted or if it's a paper record, destroyed. And other than that, it's probably unsecured under the guidance. Uh, if, it, uh, if there's been a breach, and that is an unauthorized disclosure, and that disclosure poses a significant risk of financial reputation or other harm to the individual, and there isn't an other exception for it, individual notice must be given. I must also add here that uh, many state laws exist for these types of notices as well. So if you have a breach, you must look at the state law for their definition of a breach, which may be very different, and also their notice requirements. Uh, business associates are required to give notice to a covered entity without re unreasonable delay, but in no case later than 60 days. And they must give them all the details that the covered entity will need to give the notice. Um, when doing a, uh, a, a breach investigation, and we've been involved in several quite substantial uh, breaches, mostly you know relating to uh, stolen laptops or in other cases uh, records that were left behind and, and things like that. Uh, it's really important to do a good assessment and good analysis and document it because uh, you may get out of the uh, notice requirement if you can find that there really wasn't a significant risk proposed. On the slides, we're running out of time, so I'm going to speed up here. Uh, there are notice. Um, to give the notice within 60 days of discovery, uh, there, and if you have a, a breach of more than 500, you must give HHS notice. If, if there's more than 500 in that state, you must also notify media. If for less than 500, you must keep a log, and you have to give an annual submission to HHS on those breaches. The notice requirements are set forth in the regulations, and I've put them on this slide. Uh, they are very important to, to meet. 
Let's go to uh, a sum up, really, of what the compliance checklist would be as of January 2011. Uh, one, you're going to have to update your privacy notice to, to address those strength in privacy rights. Uh, eventually, you will have to update your business associate contracts, but you should be mindful of it if you're renewing or modifying them at this time. Uh, if you're a business associate, you're now subject. You now have to have written policies and procedures that comply with the privacy and the security rules. Uh, you should make sure you have a breach policy and procedure in place, including a procedure for if there's a stolen laptop, how are you going to conduct your assessment, who's going to conduct it, and how are you going to undertake it. Uh, and furthermore, there is a training requirement in the regulations uh, for whenever you have a material change in your policies and procedures. Uh, there is expanded enforcement under the high-tech regs that have been reviewed on this slide. Uh, we are now uh, at the six-minute mark, so uh, I want to uh, thank you for attending. We have received uh, several questions from our audience. Uh, unfortunately, because of the amount of content that we've had to discuss here, we do not have time to respond to them during this webinar. Uh, we will uh, respond to those uh, questions directly by email to the individuals who submitted the questions. Again, thank you. Uh, if you need any further assistance, uh, please do not hesitate to contact us. Good day.